Hello once again friends. Our talk here is going to be on abnormal labor and delivery. So if you haven't watched the talk on normal labor and delivery yet, I highly encourage you to do so. It's always important to understand normal before you uh, try to understand abnormal. Um, now we're going to talk here about abnormal labor as a process. We're not going to talk about some abnormal things that can happen during labor, things like shoulder dystocia and prolapsed umbilical cord. Uh, we're going to be talking about the stages of labor and abnormalities of those stages, namely things that cause labor to be prolonged. So that's going to be our focus here. Just a friendly reminder, if you haven't done so already, I highly encourage you to subscribe to my Patreon page, www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. Um, if you like these videos, I provide them for free, uh, but you know it takes a lot of work and energy, takes me away from my family and from my job. Uh, just chip in a dollar a month, that's all I ask. Um, it really goes a long way. Uh, thank you for your consideration. All right, let's get on to our abnormal labor and delivery material here. So you will want to understand what each of these stages mean, and I'm only going to briefly go over it here. Uh, but if, let's say, you get a question on the test that says a woman's two and a half centimeters dilated, she's been that way for five hours, um, she's having contractions every... Uh, four minutes, which of the following is the diagnosis, or is there no diagnosis, she's normal, send her home. Or she's at six centimeters dilated, 100% effaced, she's been that way for three hours, which of the following is the diagnosis, or is she normal, do you send her home? You need to know what each of these stages are, and you need to know how long they can be in each stage, namely what's the upper limit of normal, how many hours is normal for her, and what, when does it become abnormally long. And those numbers differ based on whether she's a prima para or a multipara. So we're going to talk about these five uh, disorders, essentially, prolonged latent, prolonged active, arrested active, prolonged second stage, and prolonged third stage. Okay, so what is labor? We talked about this in the normal labor and delivery section. There's some disagreement on, uh, on the exact definition, but what everybody agrees on is that labor is regular contractions accompanied by cervical change. If you have just regular contractions or contractions at all, but it's not accompanied by cervical change, be it effacement and or dilation, then you're not in labor. Okay, Braxton Hicks contractions. They're contractions, but it's not labor. Okay, you have to have cervical change in addition to the contractions. Now, what is regular contractions? Herein lies the disagreement. So some people will say it's got to be every three minutes. Some people say it's got to be every five minutes. Some people say that the contractions have to last every or have to last 30 seconds. Some people say it has to last 45 seconds. So the minimal definition for a regular contraction is every five minutes lasting 30 seconds, at least. But some people say it's got to be every three minutes lasting 45 seconds to a minute. So it really just depends on who you talk to. Um, I don't think you're going to get anything like this on the test. They'll probably give you something that makes it look very regular, like every three minutes lasting a minute uh, each. Okay, Something that's very obviously regular contractions. So remember, stage one is a closed cervix to full dilation. So basically, you're starting effacement. You're 50% effaced, but maybe only one centimeter dilated, all the way to full effacement and full dilation. That's stage one. That's divided up into latent, which is, uh, which is closed to three to four centimeters dilated, and active, which is three to four centimeters to full dilation. Stage two is full dilation to delivery. Stage three is delivery of fetus to delivery of placenta. And stage four is the two hours following delivery, during which there are a number of complications that can occur, and so we want to observe her. This is Friedman's curve. It plots cervical dilation over time, 
And note that you have the latent phase and the active phase, both of stage one. And the latent phase goes all the way to about three to four centimeters dilated. And then the active phase starts. And it's the active phase where you get that acceleration of cervical dilation. Mostly what's going on during the latent phase is the effacement. During the active phase, it is dilation. And this is stage one here, divided into latent and active. And then stage two obviously begins at 10 centimeters dilated. So these are the expected values. These are the upper limit of normal. So most women are going to be well below these values. Uh, latent stage one, no more than 20 hours for a prima para, no more than 14 hours for a multi para. Active stage one, no more than five to six hours for a prima para, no more than four to five hours for a multi para. Now with active stage one, because the cervix is dilating more quickly, it's more helpful to understand the normal active stage one as a rate of cervical dilation. All you're doing here is you're taking six centimeters, that's from four centimeters to 10 centimeters, and dividing it by the maximum number of hours that would be normal. So if you divide six by five or six, you get one to 1.2 centimeters per hour. That's the minimum rate of cervical dilation. So if a woman is six centimeters dilated, you check on her two hours later and she's nine centimeters dilated, well that's three divided by two, that's 1.5 centimeters per hour. Great, she's progressing great, okay? Whether she's a prima para or a multi para. Now on the other hand, if she's five centimeters dilated, you check on her two hours later and she's six centimeters dilated. Well, that's one divided by two and that's 0 0.5 centimeters per hour. That's slow regardless of whether you're a prima para or a multi para. And we would consider that uh, we, we would consider that to be on the way to a delayed active stage one. Stage two is two hours for a prima para and one hour for a multi para. You add one hour to that if she's received spinal anesthesia and stage three is 30 minutes. So this is my adaptation of Friedman's curve, uh, giving you what a typical multi para looks like, a typical prima para looks like in the blue and purple respectively and then these abnormalities. Now we're not going to talk about precipitous labor because typically with precipitous labor you're not really ever going to see these patients uh, unless they you know, come into the ER and they're already 10 centimeters dilated and pushing. Uh, I, you might have watched my previous lecture, told you about my sister's friend last week who went into labor at home. She knew she had a breech baby, called the ambulance, about 15 minutes later, in the ambulance, on the road, she gave birth to a breech baby. That's precipitous labor. It happened just like that. Most women, thankfully, don't have to deal with that. <laughs> so uh, here's your multipara and your primapara. These are normal. Okay, it took the multipara, oh, about seven hours to reach active stage one. And then to get from active stage one to stage two, took her about three hours. Totally normal. That's great. Prima para, normal too. Took her about 10, or 10 hours to get uh, to active stage one, and then took her about four hours to get to stage two. Okay, those are both normal. So we're going to talk about three of these here, uh, and then we'll talk about another one that I didn't put on here uh, just because it's more obvious. Uh, but uh, we're going to talk about prolonged latent, prolonged active, and arrested active. And I'll come back to this diagram uh, as needed. First, I want to talk about the monovideo unit. A monovideo unit can be helpful to you clinically. So this is really an ingenious way of determining the adequacy of your uterine contractions. So what a monovideo unit is, is it's, you, so you look, let's say you have your tochometer and you look at the contraction and there's a, the uterus is going to have a baseline tone. Okay, what you're looking at is the peak pressure during the contraction. You take that pressure and you minus the resting tone of the uterus. So you have the change during the contraction. And you multiply that by the frequency of contractions in 10 minutes. Okay, and another way you can do this is just take each contraction individually 
and take the peak pressure minus the resting tone and then take each one individually over a frame of 10 minutes and then add those all together. Uh, so here's an example. A patient has five contractions in 10 minutes, each with a peak pressure of 70 millimeters of mercury and the resting tone is 13 millimeters of mercury. How many monovideo units? Well, 70 is the peak pressure minus the resting tone of 13. That's 57. There were five of them in 10 minutes. 57 times 5 is 285 monovideo units. Like I said, you can, you can take each contraction over a course of 10 minutes and just take the peak pressure minus the resting tone and then just add those up over the 10 minutes and you'll have your monovideo units. This is why it's useful. It's generally accepted that 200 monovideo units over those 10 minutes is needed for labor to progress properly. If you have less than that, it suggests prolongation or arrest of labor. That's not enough. If you don't have more than 200, it's not enough to be conducive for a properly prog progressing labor. And that's typically going to be due to inadequate uterine contraction. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about prolonged latent phase. So prolonged latent phase means you're spending too much time in the latent phase. So the patient is in labor, so it's not false labor. She has cervical change. Okay, let's say she's effaced, and she, but she remains less than three to four centimeters dilated for more than 20 hours if she's a prima para, or more than 14 hours if she's a multipara. Now I could see a test question telling you that this patient has been two centimeters to three centimeters dilated for 18 hours. You'll need to know if she's a G2P1 or if she's a G1P0, okay? Because if she's a multipara, that's too long. If she's a prima para, she's still in the normal range. What causes prolonged latent phase? The number one cause of prolonged latent phase is anesthesia that was administered too early. Mom came into the labor and delivery unit, she's in pain, she's uncomfortable, and the resident, the attending, called anesthesia, anesthesiologist gave her a spinal. What's happened now is that anesthesia has slowed down her progression through labor. Anesthesiologists, however, should know that anesthesia shouldn't be given too early because it will prolong the latent phase. Another thing that can prolong the latent phase is your regular contractions. There's two kinds of irregular contractions. Hypotonic contractions, which are infrequent, weak contractions, or hypertonic contractions, which are strong contractions, but they're really short. So you may have a really, really strong contraction, 100, 100 millimeters of mercury, let's say, but it's very short. It lasts only 10 seconds. Remember, they should be at least 30 seconds at the very minimum. Okay, so that's a hypertonic contraction. So these kinds of contractions can prolong the latent phase too because you need to have both frequent contractions and adequately strong contractions and long enough contractions that last long enough to, uh, to elicit change. Now the differential of prolonged latent phase is false labor. So if she's not truly in labor, she's not going to dilate. Okay, so let's say a woman comes in and she says, I've been having contractions for the last day, tw last 24 hours. And you look and she's two centimeters dilated. Well, the question is, is she really in labor? Okay, she may be two centimeters, but she's not in labor because there's no cervical change. Okay, and what you really want to look for is effacement. Now, this can be difficult to tell because the question is, has she gone from one to two, maybe to two and a half centimeters over the course of 24 hours? And she really is changing, but she's changing very slowly. Or is she just not in labor? There really is no cervical change. There's just a little bit of dilation, which can happen, but there's really no significant cervical change. And so she's not really in labor. So the differential between prolonged, uh, with prolonged latent phase is false labor. So what we do is we tell her to rest, we give her IV morphine sedation, and if the contractions stop after administration of morphine, then she was, is presumed to have been in false labor. If, cervical, if, if we give her the IV morphine 
and after the sedative wears off, their cervical change, then she's assumed to be in prolonged latent phase. Okay, that, that's true labor. So that's how we manage it. And usually by the time you, the, the sedative wears off, uh, then she should have progressed. There should be a significant cervical change, okay, for one reason or another. So that's the management of prolonged latent phase. And it also helps you differentiate out from false labor. So rest and IV morphine sedation. So which of these, C, B, or A, is prolonged latent phase? So this is the mean here, and then these are three abnormal curves. Which one is prolonged latent phase? I'll give you a chance to pause it and look at it. And the answer is A. Okay, so note here, three centimeters. That's going to be three to four centimeters is our cutoff for uh, our going from latent to active stage one. And you can see here that A is where we're spending all this time in, in uh, the latent phase, 20 hours. That's the cutoff for a multipara. So 20 hours for a multipara, 14 hours for, uh, sorry, 20 hours for a primapara. Okay, 20 hours is the cutoff for a primapara. Uh, 14 hours is the cutoff for a multipara. So if she were a multipara at this point right here, she would be considered prolonged latent phase. But if she's a primapara, it's 20 hours. Okay. So prolonged active phase. The way you're going to determine prolonged active phase, uh, there's two ways. You can go at it by the number of hours, four to five hours for a multipara, five to six hours for a primapara, or you can go at it with cervical change. So what is usually done is you examine the woman every hour, either the nurse does it or you do it, and you then divide the change by the number of hours, and you get a rate. And that rate should be no less than 1 to 1.2 centimeters per hour for a primapara, and no less than 1.2 to 1.5 centimeters per hour for a multipara. Now, what can be behind prolonged active phase? And the causes of prolonged active phase are the three Ps. So the three Ps are passenger, pelvis, and power. Passenger and pelvis kind of go together. So they're the way of getting the baby out. And if the baby is too big or if the pelvis is too small, that's going to cause a problem. So passenger can be increased fetal size or it can be abnormal orientation in utero. Okay, so if the baby is breech, for instance, or if the baby is in a transverse lie, or something like that. The pelvis, obviously, if the bony pelvis is just not anatomically normal, then that uh, can be a problem, too. Uh, just a side note here, history can be important. So if uh, a mom had an issue with a previous baby, uh, if... Uh, abnormal or prolonged labor progression, and that baby was smaller than this baby is measuring on ultrasound, then it's likely that there's going to be cephalopelvic disproportion, where the problem is the passenger or the pelvis. Uh, but if the baby that she had before was larger and she had a vaginal delivery, and this baby is measuring smaller, then she's likely fine. CPD is unlikely. Okay, so that's just a little pearl for you. Okay, the, we really can't do anything about passenger or pelvis. We can't make the baby smaller, and we can't make the pelvis bigger. So the only thing we can do is the power part. And the power is going to be, the problem here is going to be dysfunctional or inadequate contractions. Okay, that's the, really the only thing that's wrong with the power. There's two things that go behind power. It's contractions and pushing. But during stage one, you're not pushing. So we're only really looking at contractions. So dysfunctional or inadequate contractions is typically the cause behind prolonged active phase. So what do we do to manage this? Well, it's going to depend on the tonicity of the contractions. And if the contractions are, are abnormal, there's a couple things we can do. We can give IV oxytocin if they're hypotonic. If they're hypertonic, we can give morphine sedation. If they are normal contractions, then you have to do an emergent cesarean section because 
there's really at that point nothing you can do about it. Okay, you can't give oxytocin if they're if if the tone of the contractions are, are normal. You can't give morphine sedation. Nothing is going to tip the scales in your favor here, so you have to do an emergent cesarean section uh, for these patients. Uh, but if the contractions are abnormal, then you can try to normalize them. Okay, so essentially what you look at is if it's prolonged active phase, look at the contractions. If the contractions are abnormal, try to normalize them. If the contractions are normal, you have to do a cesarean section. Okay, so which one of these is prolonged active phase? So we know what A is. So is it B or C? It's B. So this is the prolonged active phase. The active, the, so the, the active phase is progressing, but it's progressing too slowly. So if you look here, here's at 15 hours, you're 3 centimeters dilated. At 18 hours, you're 6 centimeters dilated. At 20 hours, you're 8 centimeters dilated. That's a rate of 1 centimeter per hour. Okay, that's too small. Too slow. Okay, arrested active phase really it's just a difference in the definition. So the, the definition of arrested active phase is where the patient is in labor and there's no cervical change during the active phase for two to three hours. Now if she were in the latent phase and there was no cervical change for two to three hours, that's okay. Okay, because that phase takes a long time and there's really not a whole lot of dilation and this should be really cervical dilation. Uh, so if she's two centimeters dilated and she's still two centimeters dilated three hours later, so let's say hour six, she's two centimeters dilated, hour nine, she's still two, two centimeters dilated, that's fine. But if, let's say at hour 14, she's six centimeters dilated and at hour 17, she's still six centimeters dilated, that is a problem. Okay, so we don't, active phase should be a fast change in dilation. Okay, it should be a fast progression of dilation. So if there is no cervical change for two to three hours, then we consider that an arrested active phase. And different people will define this differently. You can see there's a lot of disagreements here. So some people will be very conservative and say it's two centimeters other, or sorry, two hours. Some will say it's got to be three hours of, of no change. Okay. The management, though, is the same for the prolonged active phase. So you're going to look at the contractions. If the contractions are normal, it's a C-section. If they're abnormal, you can try to normalize them. Okay. Uh, so finally here, um, if you can pick out which one arrested is arrested active phase, it shouldn't be too difficult because we know what the other ones are. It's C. Okay. And one more thing I want to bring up. Um, oh, I'll go all the way back here. So another thing that you can do for hypertonic contractions to try more normalize it, I did read, is to administer terbutaline. I, I read that. I've never seen it done, uh, but I did read that. So you can take that for what it's worth, look that up, do some research. Okay, so uh, the prolonged second stage. So when you're at second stage, you're 10 centimeters dilated and you're pushing. If you are in second stage, from the minute you start second stage, it should take no longer than two hours if you're a prima para and no more than one hour if you're a multi para. And remember, you have to add one hour to that if she's received spinal anesthesia. So if you get on a test question that the patient has been pushing for three and a half hours, Regardless of whether she's a prima para or a multi para, you know that that, regardless of whether she's received spinal anesthesia or not, you know that three and a half hours is definitely a prolonged second stage. Again, the causes behind prolonged second stage is again here the three P's. And oftentimes uh, it's going to be the passenger uh, with prolonged second stage, but it could also be the pelvis. Or the uh, or, or the power. Okay, so any of these can be behind it. I put the passenger here though because there's some unique things behind prolonged second stage. So uh, increased fetal size, 
persistent OT position, in which case you're not getting the head properly aligned with the changing dimensions of the pelvis, uh, abnormal presentation, breach for instance, and asyncletism where the head kind of gets wedged in the pelvis. And again, power is going to be very important. So if, uh, if she's having inadequate contractions uh, or if the mother is fatigued, if she's not pushing properly or if she's not pushing in conjunction with the contractions, that can prolong the second stage because the baby's not descending uh, properly. So the management again here is to assess contractions. You can see a theme emerging here. Okay, if the contractions are abnormal, you're going to have problems progressing in labor. So the very first thing you want to do is assess the contractions. If the contractions are inadequate, you give IV oxytocin. If the contractions are adequate, then you want to assess the engagement of the fetal head. Now this is unique to the second stage because in the second stage, the cervix is totally dilated. So you have access to the fetus. And because you have access to the fetus, you can theoretically pull the fetus out. Okay, even if mom is unable to push. So if the contractions are adequate, you assess the engagement of the fetal head. If the fetal head is engaged, you can try to do a forceps delivery or a vacuum delivery. But if the fetal head is not engaged, you can't do that. And in that case, you have to do an emergent cesarean section because you can't give IV oxytocin because the contractions are adequate. You can't do forceps or vacuum delivery because the fetal head is not engaged. So you're pretty much, you have your hands tied. Okay, and then finally, a prolonged third stage is a failure to deliver the placenta in less than 30 minutes. And the causes here can be inadequate contractions or it can be abnormal placentation. So inadequate contractions, remember the uterus has to contract, it's got to constrict in order for those placental villi to shear off the uterine wall. Okay, if it doesn't, if the uterus doesn't contract, if it's atonic, then you're going to run into problems with uh, placental delivery. If the placenta is 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 uh, placentated too deeply, if it's rooted too deeply into the uterine tissue, into the myometrium and beyond, uh, then that's going to be a problem because it's just rooted too deeply into the uterus. Okay, so those are the typical causes for prolonged third stage. The management again here is to assess contractions. Okay, the uterus should be contracting uh, after the baby is delivered. IV oxytocin is very often given uh, just as a prophylaxis for prolonged third stage, especially given after cesarean deliveries. Uh, so you can give IV oxytocin for a prolonged third stage. Uh, if you've already done that, then you want to attempt a manual removal after 30 minutes. Very rarely you have to do a hysterectomy. Uh, but at, it's at 30 minutes where we really have to consider uh, intervening because uh, you run into the risk of hemorrhage and the need to do a DNC and all those awful things that you really don't want to do. Okay, so uh, remember the signs of placental delivery. There's a gush of blood where the blood comes out around the placenta. It's been accumulating behind the, between the placenta and the uterine wall, and then as the edge of the placenta separates, that blood gushes out. That's often accompanied by an elongation of the, the umbilical cord that's attached to the placenta, and you should just be applying some gentle traction on that, and that should just gradually come out. That, and you, you grab with, the, your, your, uh, with your clamp, and you're just pulling on it ever so slightly. And it should come out in, in much less than 30 minutes. Okay, so that is prolonged third stage.